share together. Let's stand up together and share this uh, call to worship. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Amen. Amy's going to come and have our reading for tonight. Our scripture reading this day, or today is from Mark 1, 16 through 20. Let us hear the word of the Lord. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who was in the boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of God for the people of God. I'm super, super short, uh, so you all can, hear, can see me a little better. If you would join me in this prayer. Creator and Redeemer God, grant us hearts that are not only committed to living life as passionate spiritual disciples, but lives committed to making and nurturing fully devoted followers of Jesus. Disciples who make other disciples who love courageously and compassionately in every community, town, and city across our annual conference, our nation, and the nations of the world. Amen.
And now, God, we simply ask that you would open our hearts and our minds and our souls, reminding us throughout this evening of who we are and whose we are. Water, water, spirit-born children of the living God. And because we adore you where you lead us, we will indeed follow. Grant us grace equal to the task that you have called us to be about, equal to the task of making passionate spiritual disciples who transform, who change the world. 
equip us, encourage us, and empower us. Take our lips, our feet, and our hands, our silver and our gold, and above all our hearts, and let them be consecrated unto thee. And so speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And this is our prayer as we make it in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Passionate spiritual disciples have this amazing ability to share glory sightings. And those glory sightings happen in different and amazing ways. And sometimes they happen to us when we least expect them. And I stand here tonight to say that God has blessed me with one of those glory sightings. And now my life will never be the same because God has brought an amazing woman into my life. And one of the things, and we were married yesterday, and now I know you go. <laughs> And I know you say, what in the world are you doing here then? <laughs> Trust me, we're going somewhere. Uh, but we are grateful and I'm thankful for her. And one of the things that we'd always do when God brought us together, that we would share stories from our lives. Because both of us have been loved well by two people who've gone on to be with the Lord. Her husband, David, and my wife, Priscilla. And we'd always share stories about the gift that they gave to us and that they left us. And we would oftentimes talk about our children. And that's when the conversation got interesting. <laughs> but I never will forget one of the stories that she shared about her son, Luke. And, and I don't know all the particulars of the details about the story, but this is what I know. Luke had gotten into trouble. He was sitting in either the principal's office or the guidance counselor's office. Anyway, it was somebody that was official in the school. And they were talking to him, and they said uh, something like this, Well, Luke, what do you want to do with your life? And Luke looks at him, and, and Luke, if you know Luke, he's always got this wonderful ability to get out of anything. And he goes, I'm going to join the family business. And so by that time, David had show, shows up at school, and the person looks at him, and he says, by the way, tell me what you do. Luke said he wants to be a part of the family business. And at that time, David was working as the youth director for the conference, but in ministry all the same. I want to be a part of the family business. I want to be a part of the family business. Just what is the family business for born-again Christians? What is the family business for those that have been water-washed and spirit-born? Friends, we've come tonight to share with you a little bit about what that family business looks like. Because regardless of what happens in our world, Regardless of what we see on CNN or Fox or any other network, even regardless of what any bishop should say or what should happen at general conference, this is the family business and it never changes. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to do everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you when? Always, even unto the close of the age. So we're in a family business that does not change. For there will always be people who will need to know the good news of the gospel. There will always be people who need to know the healing touch of Jesus. There will always be people who need to be fed both physically and spiritually. And so tonight we want to share with you a little bit about passionate spiritual disciples. And to show you how important that really is, 
In Mark's gospel, Jesus has this habit of using this word an awful lot. He would say immediately. Or in some translations, he would say straight away. And what that says to me is that when Mark would write those words, it meant Jesus meant business and, and not like tomorrow, but right now. And so Mark's gospel uses the word immediate a lot. For there is a immediacy in the call of Jesus. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people and immediately... They left their nets and followed him. Immediately, they joined the family business. True disciples do this. First, they love God with all of their heart and all of their mind and all of their souls. There's no other way that you're going to begin this journey of being a disciple without that first being in your heart. To love God with all your heart, and all your mind, and all your soul. And then comes the second part, and love your neighbor as yourself. Passionate spiritual disciples love God. And they love their neighbors as themselves. Spiritual disciples learn. They are constant learners. They understand that the Spirit of God is always teaching them new and amazing and extraordinary things. How dare we have the audacity to try to limit the work of the Holy Spirit? It is constantly teaching and learning and molding and shaping us. Passionate spiritual disciples lead. They lead. They make disciples. Now, a disciple, when you hear that word, or even when you hear this word, a passionate spiritual disciples, a disciple, what do you think about? And what I want you to do is take a minute or two and turn to your neighbor and begin to share. If somebody asks you, what is a passionate spiritual disciple? What would you say? Turn to your neighbor and tell them. The world is asking us that every day. Yeah, yeah. Well, talk, talk, talk. Get in there with William. Don't get in there with him. He, he, go on and talk to the superintendent. Help him out. All right, I know that that is a conversation that you could have a lot more time on. But I just want you to shout out a little bit about what you shared with your neighbor. When you hear that phrase or those comments, what comes to mind? Come on, talk to me. Who said power? Follower. Follower. Okay, got you back there. Yeah, follower. Submission. Submission. Obedience, someone who loves. On fire? Enthusiastic. Enthusiastic. So you mean that a passionate spiritual disciple doesn't get up in the morning and look like they had nails for breakfast? <laughs> Is that what you're telling me? What else did you say? Sincere. Sincere. Part. An agent. agent for Christ. Who said that? Loving? There you go. So I'll... I'll Pardon me? Tells the story of Jesus. Tells the story of Jesus. Excellent. They do what? Empowered. They empowered. Jesus. That's a, it's the air they breathe. They can't help themselves. A good Christian. Now, disciple is not a new word. In fact, that word is over 2,000 years old, and the concept of it is even older than that. It's older than that. Lots of people had disciples that, that followed them. Socrates, Aristotle. 
but, but they didn't have the power that Jesus has. But it describes a person who follows Jesus. They are a student. They are a learner. And they love, they learn, and they lead. And Jesus always had this threefold way. I call it a threefold way of helping disciples live into what that meant. You see, friends, I, I have news for you. You cannot be touched by Jesus Christ and not be changed. You cannot be changed, and excuse my French, and sit on your butt. Those two things don't go together. They don't even sound right. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, but I'm going to keep this to myself. They don't go together. It's almost like God talking to Moses, and Moses makes all these excuses. Well, Lord, I would go, but I, I don't speak eloquently enough. And, and he makes all these excuses, and it's like God turns to him and he says, Moses, I don't want to hear your excuses. This is not multiple choice. There is no option. Every last one of y'all, and I'm talking like my grandma now, every last one of y'all who dared to breathe that you are a Christian, you don't have an option of telling this story. There is no option of doing it. What the option is, is if you're going to be passionate about it. There's no option. And Jesus did it by having the disciples watch him. Trust me, the world is watching you. When I gave my life to the Lord, I have a brother, his name is Calvin, and Calvin is the daredevil, and he'd always get people in trouble, and, and we were playing basketball one day, and I, I'm a pretty good ball player, and he just kept fouling me, and I was in college, I, I was at Pfeiffer at the time, and he says, and he just kept fouling me, I said, Calvin, you got one more time to foul me. And he did it one more time. I beat him up, knocked him down the hill. And then, and then he gets up and he said, I thought you were a Christian. So I walk down to Scotland Naked Store and I buy Charles Blow Pops and I bring them back and give them to him. And you know what I was doing? I was trying to say, I'm sorry. Passionate spiritual disciples have a conscience about them. I have a conscience about them. They learn by watching they learn by doing, and they learn by teaching others. They learn by teaching others. It's like the prophet Jeremiah would say, it's like fire. Anybody know the rest of that scripture? Shut up in my bones. What? Come on, you can talk back to me. It's like fire shut up in my bones. You're supposed to be passing spirits to the side, so you're supposed to know this. It's like fire shut up in my bones, and it won't, what, don't, won't do what? won't leave me alone. Jeremiah says it. It's like fire shut up in my bones, and it won't leave me alone. I have to tell somebody as a passionate, when you're passionate about something, you tell others. I'm passionate about my new wife. I love my new wife. And if you want to hear some more about it, see me after this service, and I'll tell you how much I love her. <laughs> and you ought to be able to see it in my eyes. Passionate spiritual disciples, you could see it and you could feel it, and you know they've been with the Lord. You know it. And so they and, and they learn and so they teach others. The other reason why I say that it is no option as far as us being spiritual, passionate disciples, we don't have to look any farther than our own baptism. Now, I know we can get into theological arguments about whether you should baptize babies or whether you should do this. I, I know that. But I'm not here to get in a theological argument with you. I'm here to tell you that the love of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit can transform anybody, anywhere, anytime, anyhow. You can get baptized in a teaspoon. But when that preacher says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, God showed up. Amen. God showed up. And so we don't have to look any farther than our own baptisms. 
and understand who we've called to be. I want you to read that with me. Read that out loud. This is from the baptismal covenant. Read it. Now, I want you to look at that and tell me what you see. When you see that first statement, the Holy Spirit working within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be what? Not just any kind of disciple, but a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. So we don't have to look any farther than our own baptism. And sometimes we have to go back and remember. This is another part of our baptismal ritual. Read that for me. Now, that's what a passionate spiritual disciple does. They witness. They give of their gifts. They give of their service. They glorify God in everything. Passionate spiritual disciples are bold and audacious witnesses. They don't believe in scarcity. They believe in practicing the fruit of the Spirit. And notice what it says, we do all this, and and notice the words, it says, we, our, not me, and I. To live into the baptismal covenant takes a community of faith. Takes a community of faith. The other thing about our baptismal covenant, and the reason why you see those words like we and our, because passionate spiritual disciples also know how to do this. They know how to live in community with each other. Now, did God say that would be easy? No. Passionate spiritual disciples lead like this. They don't lead from a place of position. Jesus did not lead from a place of position. Here is the Son of God who humbled himself, who taught and loved and put up with people like Peter. And and I could draw a blank and insert my name there. And he never did it from a position. Never. Never. And so across our annual conference, what I'm trying to help our leadership to do is to begin to lead. You've been given a position like nobody has to tell me that I was elected a bishop on July 13, 2016. Nobody has to tell me that. And if I don't know it already, all I have to do is sit by the phone. It sure enough will come to me. (laughs) And so I know the position But long before I held the position as a pastor, as the chair of a committee, or or anything, I was simply a water-washed, spirit-born child of God. And every once in a while, as I'm leading, I have to go back and remember that. That the position that matters most is that I'm leading from the heart of Jesus Christ. The position that matters most is that I ask myself over and over again, what is it that breaks the heart of God? As a passionate spiritual disciple, that is the position that I lead from first of loving God with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, and love my neighbor as myself. That's the position. Because, see, we go crazy with some positions sometimes. We get a position and we think we're a bag of chips and all of that, or however they say it. I know that's old, but we get a position and we think we're God's gift to the world. Now, y'all come on. Now, they tell me I'm the bishop so I could say what, (laughs) but, but, but when you're leading from a positional point of view, that's what you do. You lord it over other people. But Jesus never did it. 
He never did it. Because positions create silos or what you call heroic silo leaders. And you'll grab hold to a position, you'll hold on to it for dear life. One of my first appointments, I was serving a three-point charge, and I was just, I just graduated from Duke. I was just out of seminary. You didn't catch that one. I was, I was fresh out of seminary. You did? I was fresh out of seminary. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. Now, now, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I did, and I know we got to get through, but I'm going to tell you what I'm, 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 I'm happy tonight because I'm married, everything is right with the world. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what we did. I took my new wife to North Carolina, and we went to Duke, and I took her to the Duke Gardens. Oh, uh, uh, this is beautiful. The gardens are so beautiful. I took her to the chapel. Oh, this is so beautiful. And Cameron Indoor Stadium was in sight of the Bryan Center. She didn't even turn that way. Oh, yeah, that, 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 that's when I knew, yeah. That's, that's when I knew. I know, and so on. But you, you passionate spiritual disciples are not heroic silo leaders. When I went to that first appointment, there was a man in my church. He had been Sunday school superintendent for 30 years. And the first thing he tells me is that, Pastor, I want to give this up. I've been doing it long enough. So I mess around and I take it from him. And what did I do that for? But I said, I thought you wanted to give it up. We don't lead from a position. It's it's non-collaboratory. It's unhealthy. It creates competition. It lacks a relational accountability, trust, and a willingness to deal with conflict. Even Jethro, the Midianite shepherd, told Moses, you're going to kill yourself trying to do this all on your own. Pray and ask God to give you leaders. They're here. Let them have it. And so to be a passionate spiritual disciple, I'm trying to help us to begin to lead from a place. You got a position. Like if I would ask you what the staff parish committee do, what would you tell me? And tell me to, tell me to, don't tell me the answer I want to hear. Tell me the answer that most staff parishes do around appointment time. Well, Bishop, that preacher you sent us. <laughs> if you don't move this preacher, we're going to stop giving our money. Now, come on, we, all, we might as well be honest. And we're leading from a position and not from a relational sense of authority. Now, I, I love lists, and I'm about to get through so William can come really tell you what a passionate spiritual disciple does. But we, we got all these lists, uh, 12 keys to an effective church, seven steps to whatever. We got all these lists, and so I get sort of weary of lists. But this is one that I thought was very helpful when I think about a passionate spiritual disciple because it gives us an idea or a window into what Jesus was like. And remember what we said about Jesus. They learned by watching, doing, and teaching others. Jesus was willing to invest in people others would have dismissed. Consider the disciples. They were not the religious elite. Peter always had a habit of sticking his foot in his mouth, saying things before he thought. But you don't have anybody in Kentucky like that. Thank the Lord. James and John always fought over who would be first in the kingdom of God. Thomas openly doubted. Judas had a secret agenda. And yet Jesus used these people to turn the world around. He looks, God looks at the heart. You could have 50, 11 degrees behind your name. I don't care how many stripes you got on the sleeve of your robe. If your heart is not right, you might as well take that robe off and sit down somewhere and stop fronting. I said it fronting. You know what fronting is, right? You need to just sit it down and stop. 
Jesus did not choose the elite. I need to go back. How do I go back? Oh, I'm going into your report now, Aunt William. Take me back. Here, let me help you, Duke graduate. Okay. Is that- okay. <laughs> hey. He- he'll be looking for a job tomorrow. So one of y'all need to open up a place on your staff. Okay. So Jesus released a responsibility and ownership to the mission. He told the disciples, I'm not going to be with you always. And so he handed that mission off to others. Into some pretty shaky hands if you want to know the truth about it. Jesus' leadership plan has a succession plan about it. He never left it to chance. Jesus practiced servant leadership better than anyone. In the classic story that I always think about this is here's the king of kings, the son of the living God. On his last meal, what does he do? Wash his feet. Now, before you get too happy and go, well, oh, that's such a nice pastoral scene. There was nothing pastoral about this scene. Just think about where they're at in Palestine at the time. And think about what the landscape is like. You got sheep, goat, you got dusty roads and all this stuff, and they got on sandals. Yeah, that's the way Sesame the Mills puts it. They got on sandals. And they're walking in the heat of the day, sometimes in rain and mud. And Jesus stoops down to wash their feet. Now tell me how, they fe- how their feet must have looked and how they must have smelled. We're talking about serious toe jam. (laughs) But Jesus washed their feet. Jesus was laser focused on the vision. He was laser focused. He took all of the distractions that came to him and he still kept his focus. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, He's praying this prayer. Y'all know the prayer, right? If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. He was laser focused on the vision. And folk, that's what we've got to do. We've got to be laser focused. The world will try to take your focus off what is important. And Lord knows it's trying. And excuse my French again, again, but while they're trying, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. And we're sitting up here arguing about everything. We got to have that laser focus about what uh, the vision is. Jesus handled distractions with grace. He's on his way to heal, I believe it's Jairus' daughter. And this woman comes out of the crowd and touches him. And Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? And the disciples say, Jesus, how do you know somebody touched you? There's so many people around you. But Jesus said, yes, somebody touched me. And he stopped. He was on his way to do something else. But he stopped. And he tells this woman, daughter, your faith has made you well. He handled that with grace. Jesus was into self-development. I'm talking to the preachers now. You can't give what you don't have. I say that over and over again. And if you broke down, tired, weary, anxious, fearful, doubtful, guess what? Your church is going to be the same way. My wife Priscilla used to tell me all the time, look, if the head ain't right, the body ain't going to be right. And pastors, you ain't Superman or Superwoman, and you show ain't Jesus. And so you have to take the time out. Jesus held followers to high expectations. I'm sorry to tell you that. 
If you're going to be a passionate spiritual disciple of Jesus Christ, it ain't going to be easy. But God has never asked us to do anything that he will not give us the courage to do. Jesus cared more about people than about rules and regulations. We get that, right? Jesus celebrated success in ministry. And Jesus finished well. And that's all I want for the Kentucky Annual Conference is to finish well and let's make some passionate spiritual disciples. And William, you're on. But the bishop is so good at reminding us that the work of the church, the work of the body of Christ, is to make passionate spiritual disciples. And over the last couple of years, he has reminded us over and over and over again how important it is for us to be about this work. And as you think about it, it should be natural to us. This should not be a surprise. It shouldn't be a message that in any way surprises us because the mission of the United Methodist Church is what? To make disciples for the transformation of the world. Our mission is to not just make ordinary disciples, it isn't to make people that will just come and sit in our pews or fill the offering plates, but our mission is the church is to somehow make disciples that do that transformative work and are about changing the world. And so as the bishop has been challenging us in this direction over the last couple of years, some of us began to ask the question, what really is a passionate spiritual disciple? How can we sort of narrow that down? How can we understand that in a way that um, that's easily uh, for our churches to grasp and understand and to begin to work towards easy for people to understand. So we took some of the things that the bishop said, we, we looked at scripture, we talked to a number of folks, and some things began to come together. One was a passage of scripture out of um, John chapter 15. And I don't know if you're familiar with John chapter 15, but the, in, in um, part of this chapter, Jesus is talking and he says, as the Father loved me, I too have loved you. This idea that, that passionate spiritual disciples understand that they are loved by God. Also, this idea that they follow or keep the commandments of Jesus and that and that they love each other. If you look down at verse 12, and this is my commandment, love each other just as I have loved you. If you jump just a little bit um, earlier in that chapter, Jesus uses this wonderful image of the vine and the branches. And you remember this image, the importance of the, vi or the branch abiding or staying connected in the vine. But it isn't just about the branch staying connected to the vine, but it's about that branch then growing in such a way that it produces fruit. And so as we looked at this passage of scripture and as we thought about the things that we were hearing from the bishop and, and people around the conference, we started just asking this question, what is a passionate spiritual disciple? And we thought we need to ask a bunch of people this question. So we asked people, and some of them are in this room tonight, what is a passionate spiritual disciple? We talked with conference teams and district teams. We talked with individual churches. We talked with individual pastors. We talked with individual lay people. And we said, what is it that's a passionate spiritual disciple? Then we began to focus in, not just on characteristics or qualities, but we began to focus in, what are the behaviors of a passionate spiritual disciple? What is it that a passionate spiritual disciple does? 
So we took the scripture, we took all this input, and we realized that it really fell into three general categories. And if you have your little card in front of you, you see what these general categories are. It's about knowing the love of Jesus, growing in the love of Jesus, and showing the love of Jesus. That passionate spiritual disciples um, are faithful to be about this work in their lives. And um, it starts out with knowing the love of Jesus. Now this isn't just knowing in sort of a, a general term, but this is active. That passionate spiritual disciples are actively, weekly, and even daily being reminded, doing things to remind themselves of the love of Jesus that is in their life. And so one of the ways that we do this is through worship. We gather with other people, and, and one of the major per reasons why we get together for worship is so that we might be reminded that Jesus loves us and what God has done for us and what the grace of God is like and is active in our lives. But I don't know... So we keep doing things um, in our daily life that remind us that we're loved. So things like um, personal worship and, and listening prayer where the Spirit can speak to us and remind us of God's love and work in our lives. Gathering with other believers that remind us that on those bad days says to us, Listen, Jesus loves you. <laughs> I know it's been hard. I know your situation, your circumstances are difficult, but Jesus loves you, reminds us of the love of God. The second thing that passionate spiritual disciples do and are actively involved in is growing in the love of Jesus. So it's not just about having a knowledge for ourselves, but, but growing in that love and having that love grow up in our lives. And one of the ways that we do that is, is through by daily being immersed in Scripture and having daily times of prayer. None of these should be surprises uh, to most of us, that we cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, but not only are we cultivating what the Spirit is trying to grow up in us, but we are also actively resisting sin in our lives. And, and that this work is... Um, is important so that we might grow in ways that we can eventually, and not eventually, but um, that we can be about the work of showing the love of Jesus in a fallen and broken world. And we do that in a whole number of ways too. We humbly serve others. And we seek mercy and justice for others. And, and we do tell the story of Jesus. And we tell our story and how our story connects to Jesus. And, and that's part of, of being a passionate spiritual disciple. They give generously. And um, they give of their time. And they give of their resources. And so um, when we think about passionate spiritual disciples and making them in our churches and um, helping others to become passionate spiritual disciples, we're not talking about simply ordinary people that come into church and sit in pews, but we're talking about people who are actively at work in knowing, growing, and showing the love of Jesus um, in their lives. Now, I don't know that this is true. We, ha we haven't done any deep work and any deep survey work on this, but, but I began to notice in my own life and other people that I was working with around this idea of passion and spiritual disciples is that we tend to focus in on one of these areas. 
right? We, we tend to be better at one of these than others. We, we tend to be naturally drawn to one of these more so than the other ones. Uh, for some people, um, it's just sort of natural in who they are. They want to be in worship. They, they go to every worship service in their church and in town. You know some of these folks. They, they love to be reminded of the love of Jesus in their life, and so they're actively seeking that all the time. But they don't very often go and help others. I recognize this in my own life. I love studying Scripture. I love doing deep dives into Scripture. I could spend a whole day on a passage of Scripture and just dig into it and see what it might mean for my life that I might grow and that the fruit of the Spirit might grow in my life. But I'm not always so good at showing love to others and being involved in justice ministries. So when we think about this, no show and grow, it's not that we just get really good at one and ignore the other ones, but that we work on all of these, that we work in the areas that we're strong in, but we also focus in where is it that I need personal growth? Where do I need to be doing better at being a passionate spiritual disciple? Now, you may notice that there's a couple of other things on the card, and, um, uh, and they're called lead indicators. And we're not going to spend a lot of time tonight. You can go on the Internet, learn all about what lead indicators are versus lag indicators. But we gave you some lead indicators, participate weekly in corporate worship, participate in small groups with spiritual um, accountability, and have a regular rhythm of service and sharing the love of Jesus. What we've discovered is that people tend to do better when somebody's asking them the question, how are you doing spiritually, and how are you doing It's showing the love of Jesus to others. We tend to do better when we have some accountability around these issues. This past Labor Day, I spent the morning uh, mowing the lawn. In the afternoon, I was binge-watching on Netflix, don't judge me, The Office. Do you know The Office? It's a sitcom. It's funny. It's no longer on the air, but you can watch it on Netflix. And this is a sitcom about um, a mid-sized paper company in eastern Pennsylvania. And the head of that paper company, or the, not the head of the paper, the head of the regional director of that office name is Michael Scott. Now, Michael Scott is somewhat of a maverick, if you've watched the show. He sort of does things his own way. And so Michael Scott, um, in this episode that I was watching on Labor Day, um, is now on to his third boss. He has already run through two bosses, and I won't give you the backstory, but it's not pretty what happened to the two previous bosses. So he's on his third boss, and... um, Um, And he's having disagreement with his boss because his boss wants him to be accountable and he does not want to have anything at all. He's used to doing things his own way. So he goes over the head of his boss and he goes to the head of the company and he's having this argument with the head of the company, which he has a long, complicated relationship with. And and they they are disagreeing about um, Michael's new boss. And Michael says this line, Truth be told, I think I thrive under a lack of accountability. (laughs) Now, that's funny when we think about it in the workplace. But that seems to be standard operating procedure in many churches, and I would argue for much of Christianity in the United States. That, that we have this idea that we thrive under a lack of accountability when we don't really have to answer somebody. Everything's private. Everything's individual. Everything's my own. Listen, I fall into this temptation as well. I, I would rather not be under accountability. But if I am going to grow as a passionate spiritual disciple and a passionate spiritual leader, I need accountability in my life. 
And so I need to be in a group of people who will ask me the question, how are you doing spiritually? You said that you were going to be, um, that you were going to have personal worship time. Have you been doing that? And I need to look somebody in the eye and answer that question. They need to be asking me, how is your prayer life going? How is your Sabbath going? How, how are you doing at these things? Because if I don't have that, I might think I'm thriving. If I'm be honest, I really don't. I tend to coast without accountability. And many of my friends who are passionate spiritual disciples say the same. And it's not only that, that, that are we um, having accountability around the mission about showing the love of Jesus to others. I said I was going to go work at the food bank and, and talk to people and pray with people. Did I do that? Uh, I, I said I was going to share with that coworker who I know is going through a difficult divorce. I said I was going to go a, and spend some time talking with them and praying with them. Did I actually do that? So the importance of accountability, and, and this isn't top-down accountability that we're talking about. We're talking about accountability with each other and our peers. We, uh, we gather together, and, and just because we love each other, we hold each other accountable. And that doesn't matter if you're a clergy person or a lay person, whether you've been a Christian for 75 years or for three days. Being part of a group that's willing to hold us accountable, accountable so that we might really thrive as the people of God and that we might really live in ways that we are disciples that are about the work of making transformation, changing the world. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to end just by saying this. The challenge of the bishop I think is not only for us to be passionate spiritual disciples, those of us gathered in the room, but how do we live that out and make more of those folks? And one way is by our own personal discipleship. If, if we're a pastor or we're a leader, who are the people that you're investing in so that they might be truly passionate spiritual disciples? But the other piece is, how are we doing at this as a church and as individual congregations? Are we creating sort of systems and rhythms within our church that allow us to help people to move closer and closer to Jesus in such a way that they, too, can be these passionate spiritual disciples? So I encourage you um, to think about this. This diagram is available all kind of places throughout our conference, but, but helping people to figure out how do they build new relation, how do our churches build new relationships with people and connect people with Jesus in the church and then train and equip and prepare them and then resource them and hold them accountable so that they can go out and begin to change the world. That's the call of Christ for us. For those of us in the United Methodist Church, and particularly for those of us as part of the Kentucky Annual Conference. So I hope you find this resource helpful. You can use that information on the card however, uh, however you find uh, useful or helpful in, uh, in your setting and in your situation. Uh, but we encourage you to think strategically about this work in your church and in your ministry. Um, Kevin Burney is now going to come and, uh, and share with us uh, this evening on some sort of practical things that we're learning as we um, talk with our clergy, as, as we plan, and as we work together towards this goal of making passion spiritual disciples. Tell me what first pops into mind when you hear emotional intelligence. What's that? <laughs> Somebody else. 
Emotional intelligence. Maturity. Maturity? Okay. Situational awareness. Situational awareness. Yeah, I grew up in, in, in Oklahoma, and uh, we called it horse sense. <laughs> that that fellow, he just didn't have horse sense. But it is that, uh, that piece that we're discovering. As a superintendent, I often discovered that when I we encountered issues with leadership, lay leadership or clergy leadership, it was often I would look at it and say, you know, what this person is attempting to do there's nothing wrong with it. That, they're right. That is what the church should be doing. Absolutely. But it was often about how they were going about doing it. That was the catch. It was that knowing how to relate to others. You, you may ask, what does emotional intelligence have to do with discipleship and leadership? And the key is, I hope you have heard that a, a key component of passionate spiritual discipleship, a key component to leadership of various kinds, and, and by the way, we all have a place of influence, therefore, therefore we all have places of leadership, but the key of all that is relational, that key of our relationship with Christ, but also how we relate to each other is so pivotal as we grow as passionate spiritual disciples and as we seek to lead in, in the church, the body of Christ. Here's a more academic uh, definition. Uh, Matthew Kimmons usually gives this presentation. Uh, but Matthew's the pastor at uh, First Church London uh, and is doing some uh, doctoral research in this very field of emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is a set of emotional and social skills that establish how we perceive and express ourselves, develop and maintain social relationships, cope with challenges, and use informational information in effective and meaningful ways. Have you ever met someone you say, well, you know, they just don't have people sense, <laughs> or they don't have relational smarts, they're just, they're just awkward, or why, well, you know, that, that person, is, it just can win people over instantly. And, and they can inspire people so quickly. Uh, you know, even if they go to Duke, they can do those things. <laughs> but again, that question, okay, why does that matter? That's all nice, Kevin. Why does that matter? Why are we here and why would we talk about that? Well, research shows a strong connection between transformational leadership and healthy emotional intelligence. Now, under underline the word transformational. We're not talking about informational leadership. We're not even using the word effective leadership. We're talking about transformational leadership. And for transformation in the world to ha happen, it has to happen in the heart of leaders and the disciples. So it has, plays an important role in that transformational uh, leadership and healthy emotional intelligence. Individuals who have unhealthy or low emotional intelligence may deeply struggle personally and relationally. The key uh, component I find hope here is that unlike your IQ, uh, emotional intelligence can change and grow. It's a flexible ability. And so if you discover places of weakness, you can strengthen that weakness. That's not, you don't have to say, well, that's just the way I am. Uh, unfortunately, that's not true of IQ. <laughs> I'm stuck with what I got. But with our emotional intelligence, our emotional understanding, our relational in intelligence, our people sense, our, our horse sense, we have impact and can grow. Uh, we did, uh, with Matthew's leadership, we've done an interesting uh, piece of uh, research. Uh, what we discovered at the Board of Ordained Ministry as we were preparing folks to working towards ordination as deacons and elders is we found out that a key component that we, we, we could influence was emotional intelligence. So we began, uh, first of all, with the Board of Ordained Ministry. We said, look, if we're going to want people to do this, we need to do it first. So our, our executive team first uh, took the assessment, and then the whole board, and now everyone who comes for commissioning now takes a measure of their emotional intelligence as they're commissioned, and then uh, as they're coming for ordination as elder or deacon. 
uh, hopefully developing a better understanding of self, hopefully our understanding of how can we as, as a body of the Board of Ordained Ministry help influence that. But through that process right now, uh, we have, uh, have had almost, well, actually 20% of our active clergy have now taken the measure. And so when you have 20% of a population, you can begin not just talking about individuals or a small group, but as a larger group in general. So on average, we found they deeply desire to be helpful and make a difference in their communities. That's, that's good news. You want a pastor that wants that kind of skill. They want to make a difference. They, they want to impact community. Uh, they're generally optimistic. Now, you know, we're, we're a resurrection people, so that's good to hear. I'm, I'm, as, as my role, I'm glad to hear that we're having people coming through who are generally optimistic. They believe in the resurrection. However, uh, as a whole, we have a weakness in that we tend to be people pleasers and tend not to assert ourselves. And then, adding to that, we often attach our feelings of self-worth to the local church. So see that combination. If, if your self-worth is coming from the local church and you're less likely to self-assert of, of that one of people please, you can see how can, that can be an awkward combination. But again, the good news is we can... We can influence that as individuals. We can influence and grow in those areas. It's not just a set fact as we seek to have healthy leadership. Now, it's also important to, to know as laity and clergy that if a person takes their, their self-worth much out of the, the, the church, how powerful do comments have on our clergy? How powerful it is, and the, and the old story is, you know, if ten people go out complimenting your sermon and one goes out, you know, criticizing it, uh, which one do you remember the rest of the afternoon? I had a dear lady in my first church that couldn't hear anything. You go, I go visit her at her house, and she had a screeching doorbell for deaf people. And you'd be on the porch and, and, and it would hurt your ears because it was so loud, and yet she would keep watching TV, just oblivious to the noise. But I want you to know, she complimented my sermon every Sunday. <laughs> and there were days I really appreciated that. <laughs> but it, so it's not always a, you know, about them, but how can we come alongside? And what's true of our clergy, because that's predominantly who we've assessed at this point, I suspect may also be true of our laity who are in leadership. So, again, what can we do about it? Uh, what, what can we do in knowing this, about this stuff about passionate spiritual disciples and it's, it's all about relational leadership and rela relational faith? Well, one thing we can do is we focus on, you know, you focus on your part. What is your mission? in the kingdom of God. What would it be like if you wrote your mission statement? What's the vision you have for your own life? And how does that can then connect to the mission of the church? What would that be like to say, this is, this is my piece of kingdom work. This is what God has called me to do. Create safe-to-fail experiments in worship, small groups, and serving. I can't tell you that uh, th this is a hard one for me to overcome. Because I like looking you know, successful. And I, I don't like failing. You know, I'm telling you, I don't like it. However, I am learning that if your ch church has not failed at some attempt of ministry, then you just aren't trying. We've got to make it all right to fail. Now, you doesn't mean you're just kind of lackadaisical and sloppy about ministry and just do whatever feels right. That's not what I'm talking about. You do your homework, you do the hard work, but then you recognize that as we experiment... Uh, researchers expect more experiments to fail than to succeed. That's how they learn 
how to succeed. And perhaps part of the reason we're struggling in reaching others is that we're not experimenting enough to learn how to succeed. So learn to celebrate something that didn't work. You know, we did our homework. Our heart was right. It met our mission, our values. It, it, it really was, you know, a good intention, and it just doesn't work. Celebrate that. Say, hey, now we know what doesn't work. What are we going to try next? Learn from it. Now, I, I raised two boys, and, and I won't go into the dynamics of that, but a question I always tried to ask when they made a mistake <laughs> is, did you learn anything? Well, yeah. Well, then it's not wasted. Creating that. I, I can't, can't uh, overemphasize how critical that is in our personal life, but also in our congregational life. Because we always know there's going to be someone going, well, knew that wouldn't work. I'm reminded of when the woman poured the uh, expensive ointment on, the, on Jesus' feet, the disciples were grumbling about, you know, well, that's a lot of money. You know, we could have given that to the poor. Well, isn't it, you know, I want to tell you, since biblical times, those who aren't doing are always criticizing those who are doing. Even if you're a disciple, you can fall into that. Making it safe to fail. And encourage each other by celebrating where you see God. Glory sightings is what we call it. Call it what you want to call it. But where is the hope that you're seeing? I had an uh, uh, opportunity to hear a person speak, and he said, you know, our, our world is divisive. The news is full of bad news. It seems dark. We, we have environmental issues. We have political issues. We have theological issues. And he said, but Christians should be the most optimistic of all. And, of course, the question is, well, okay, why? And said, because we believe in the resurrection. We forget the resurrection could not happen. It should not happen, and yet it happened. And as resurrection people, we believe what could not happen, cannot happen, it can't, can't happen, shouldn't happen, happens. And so we've got to have eyes looking for signs of the resurrection. Where are the signs of the resurrection in your community where you go, wow, that's, that, that's exciting, glory. A sign of the resurrection, a sign of light in the darkness. Uh, one of the uh, stories we've shared is an example of a church that, uh, you know, a, a young man about 19 years old came forward and and said, you know, God's really laid a ministry on my heart. So he went to talk to the pastor and said, Pastor, you know, God's really wanted me to do it. He goes, what's that? You know, he goes, well, God wants me to do a back-to-school carnival gathering here at the church. Well, they'd only done about a 14 million back-to-school carnivals at the church. Uh, there was lots of grumbling about, you know, how much it cost, and none of those people came to our church, and, and now there's uh, 14 other churches that do the same thing. So all those negative things came to mind. But the pastor thought, what the heck? Here's a young man who feels a call, and instead of grousing, they decided to support him and his desire to follow through. And so he organized it. He advertised it. He made the connections, got the supplies, got the inflatables. It was a big deal. And the church began to rally and help. Now, the pastor shares that uh, it wasn't a huge turnout. Uh, it cost some money. Uh, none of the people came to church, so no connections, no fruit. But they decided to celebrate that Sunday because what it required was a flip from looking at what it's going to cost and what's going to be the output and why should we do this again, we're tired, to say, here's a 19-year-old that we can help grow as a leader. And he's learned how to organize people. He's learned how to promote. He's learned how to plan He's learned how to sell. And suddenly the mission was not so much about the back-to-school carnival, but about how can we help this person 
grow as a spiritual leader. So that's the challenge before us. Uh, next steps for, for connecting. Uh, next steps for after tonight, uh, do what? <laughs> uh, first of all, I can say to you that these slides will be available on the conference website along with the video embedded in the slides. Uh, so those are resources. But, you know, first of all, pray. It would be a shame if you went back home and said, wasn't that a good night? And, and I want to say, so what? If we don't follow it, okay, what's God calling us to do about it? In our context, in our location, you see, it's going to look different at your church than it's going to look at down at, at someone else's church in a different community. Uh, there's a free study guide. Uh, you can find that uh, on the Connectional Cafe. And it's discovering your church's story. Before, you know, as we're looking at where we're going, we need to know where we've been and what the celebrations have been, the challenges, but also what are our strengths as a congregation. And then asking for help. Checking with your pastor. Uh, your district superintendent would love to get a call from a church, a layperson or clergy, that's not about the next appointment or what the pastor did, but how can we make disciples? I guarantee you there will be enthusiasm on the part of your district superintendent. But also you see some resources there. Tammy Coleman, who's uh, part of your Owensboro district, is available, uh, can direct you to resources, can connect you with uh, other things, the vital congregations that can work with you and help you. But understand, uh, we're here to walk alongside you. It's God working through you and looking through us. As we work together, Matthew's even included his email. Uh, he's, his catchphrase is always, I don't know anything, but I'll be glad to talk to you. <laughs> but Matthew is a good connection as well as we move forward in making and in becoming passionate spiritual disciples. Uh, my, my father died a few years ago, and he uh, worked for 25 years on the Rock Island Railroad. Um, by the way, I, I'm, I'm reminded, early, uh, early church, I'm told, in the, the Puritan era, that there was someone assigned to walk down the aisle and bop people on the back of the heads as they were dozing off a little bit. But, you know, looking at you, it just came to mind. I'm sorry. It just kind of... <laughs> but my father uh, was a collector of stuff. Uh, we had a one-car garage that never had a car in it. Because there's dad's stuff. Now, my mom took care of the house. Dad got the garage. And so, uh, you know, there was a little bit of anything and everything. I think my father must have had, thought it was a cardinal sin to uh, buy a screw or a bolt. Because I think we had at least three coffee cans full of various sizes of screws and bolts. Now, as a kid, I always get frustrated because Dad would take an hour looking for the right screw. Then, Dad, you know, Walmart's 10 minutes away. Can we just go buy some screws? So he was a collector of stuff. And so when he passed away, one of the challenges, I was so glad I live in Kentucky and not Oklahoma because that meant my brother had to clean out Dad's garage. And then we played the game of, you know, what's this? <laughs> well, this is one of the things I inherited from my father. And it became a question of, okay, just, okay, what is that? And so I began to research, and in make, knowing Dad's railroad connections, I discovered this is a tool used by section hands that worked on the railroad. And section hands were the ones that laid the track, hard, hard labor. They're the ones that uh, drove the spikes with malls. They were the ones that realigned the track. Did you see... When a you know, train of several tons keeps going over the tracks, it shuffles the tracks. A lot of folks don't realize a railroad track, it, the, the, the rail is nailed to the ties, but the ties are not anchored to anything. And so the, the, the rail moves. So it was these men's job to take care of the rails. And I discovered that the, these were often called Gandhi dancers. And I discovered that tools like this, uh, as the story goes, was made by a company out of Chicago named Gandhi. So many of the tools, and this is one of the tools they would use in, in working with rail, 
uh, made by Gandhi, so they became known as Gandhi dancers. And to better understand that, you need to understand that uh, it took eight men or more just to move a track. So they, they would take uh, rods like this and put it under the track and, and bump that track all at the same time, and it became important for all of them to pull at the same time. So they would have a collar, and the collar and a rhythm so they would know in rhythm when to pull together. Because as one of the callers said, no man can move that rail alone. So they all had to pull together in the same direction at the same time. So the, the caller was there, but that was not his only purpose because one of the callers that I saw in a, in a video and interview said, sometimes a man gets weary and gets discouraged and he needs someone to lift him up. So there was humor and sometimes there was a religious message in, in the, what the caller would be saying at the same time as they're doing this hard labor together. And it, it, I love this phrase. He said, sometimes they need someone to preach to them. And as I watched videos and read more, I realized there is an image for us. Because, uh, you know, of those eight men, who was the most important man? Every one of them. It took every one of them pulling the same direction at the same time to get the job done. Folks, we have a church that uh, is made up of laity and elders and deacons and local pastors, and not one is more important to the other in getting the mission done. I'm no more called than the layperson. I'm no more called than the deacon or local pastor and vice versa. It takes all of us because none, none of us can pull and move that mission by ourselves. And if you think moving rails hard, try transforming the world. It's important. Sometimes we get discouraged and get tired and we need some, some word of encouragement. Sometimes we... Uh, just don't think we'll be able to get it done. And sometimes we need somebody to preach to us. If only we would all listen to the call of our, uh, the voice of our caller, Jesus, who calls us to work in rhythm, work side by side, pulling together. And I call that the gospel of the Gandhi dancer. Bishop. Bernie, you will be looking for a job tomorrow. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kidding with him. You've heard a lot of stuff. You sit here for almost for an hour and a half. You've heard a lot of stuff. You've seen a lot of slides. But I'm going to share with you the best benediction I ever heard in my life. The preacher gets up, and it was a woman preacher. She gets up, and she says, I have nothing more to say to you but to get out. To get out and be those disciples that change the world. All the charts, all the slides in the world will never transform the world unless you find it in your heart to remember who you are, whose you are. No legislation is going to do it unless our hearts all right. It's the only way we're going to make disciples. And that's the family business. All this other stuff, like my grandma say, don't make no sense. You are part of the family business. And so we're going to stand tonight and we're going to sing, I think it's two verses of Here Am I, Lord. You are part of the family business. Go. Get out of here after this song. And make disciples who change the world.